Hi Shweta, welcome to the show. Hi Akarish, thank you. Thank you for coming. Can you yeah. introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi everybody. My name is Shweta, and I am from Assam, India. Uh, and I'm a master student uh, currently in Amity, Noida. And I also freelance, and I also write. Like I have a passion for writing, fashion, and I create content for a lot of uh, independent. Um, agencies and also freelance networks and currently i'm also interning in a couple of uh, places i uh, plan to uh, further get into jobs and i want to you know get into paid freelancing mm. so that's about it for now and mm. let's begin okay so the topic that we are covering today are divided into two parts the first one is marital rape and the second one is why journalism is the fourth pillar of democracy so let's start with marital rape it is such a serious issue to talk about so let's start with the definition right in your own words how would you define marital rape so basically marital rape is um between spouses two people who are married mm-hmm. and it's a form of a sexual intercourse where the element of consent is absent you know i strongly believe that when there is consent that is when both parties should indulge in an act so when mm. the element of consent is absent usually mm. and this usually is from the wife side or the female side that is when it can be termed as a marital rape as in rape in the institution of a marriage between two okay. so is it legal in india um until now actually it, it has been recognized for now Mm. that it is an ongoing issue that needs to you know have laws and needs mm. to be criminalized but sadly it it has not been criminalized yet in india compared to some other countries like 52 countries until now have criminalized it but india sadly is not one of them there are still petitions being filed by karnataka high court and there are a lot of been debates going on because a lot of ngos are also filing petitions but mm. the verdict is yet to be you know uh given and i think it's a long process of you know going through that process the loopholes i think there is so much taboo involved in it as well like a wife complaining against her husband is looked down by her family and the her spouse's family so they usually just let it go which is very sad right okay uh what is the philosophy that you think uh, makes it legal in india till now i think that uh, in india when you talk about marriage uh, india is a very traditional kind of society so what mm-hmm. happens is when marriage comes in um it becomes a personal matter and it's between two people so we mm-hmm. say ki you know if it's inside the house it's between four walls so it's none mm-hmm. none of others business right so, and men you know in india especially because it's a patriarchal based society men mm. think that once they marry a woman they are entitled to her mm. like it's it's their property which is wrong mm. you know mm. and women also i feel because they are on the receiving end you know mm. emotionally it is very difficult for them to come out and to speak and to say ki ha mere sath ye hua hai this has happened to me you know mm. because to even realize and accept that this has happened takes a long time so mm. forget about you know coming and protesting and trying to you know fight a case you know mm. and especially because in the rural areas this is very highly seen because in the mm. rural areas women do not have jobs they have you know lack of education lack of that sense you know that what's mm. happening so that is where i think the women kind of lack the part and that's why ngos and all help but it's still a very long ride because india's legal system is also full of two courts right and because when once you're married it's very difficult to leave a marriage you know women mm. sometimes don't even decide how many children to have or take normal decisions when it comes to the household you know because mm. they're dependent on men and that's why we are encouraging women to get you know independent to study more to get degrees to come out there and you know make a life of their own you know mm. so that things like this can be pointed out and things like this should that it should not happen 
Right. You know? So I think the biggest problem is that women, um, they they are very they are very naive in a lot of ways. And I'm not like I'm not talking about me or you know somebody else, but in general, like even like educated women like us, like I know people who have had you know who have had to stay in a marriage you know abused for eight years, and after eight mm. years they realize oh my god this has happened to me you know, mm. and abuse can be a different type you know. I feel that physical abuse is a one that is highlighted you know because yeah okay somebody has slapped me so this is a form of abuse you need to stand up. But what about mm. other forms of abuse? You know, abuse in a marriage, emotional abuse, name calling, you know, slut shaming. These are also types of abuse. So the mm. awareness is still somewhere, you know, absent. There is a gap. You see. So this is why I think marital rape is also a very sensitive, you know, and very important topic, which is now coming in limelight. But to criminalize it and to take it to that level, it's a long journey. I feel that when men get married to women, sometimes they feel that they now have an implied consent of the woman to have intercourse with them anytime they want. Absolutely. Yeah, and uh, speaking in terms of domestic issues, it is sad that uh, the courts have accepted other issues such as cruelty and dowry death, but still refuse to recognize such an integral uh, issue. Moving on, uh, since there is no legal recourse right now, what steps can a woman take uh, if she's a victim of such an unfortunate incident? What steps can she take to get justice? I think, you know, as I've said before, the concept of rape has been very much prevalent in India and people have recognized it, you know, and rape is you know, highly punishable in India now. Because, you know, after the 2012 case of, you know, Nirbhaya, after mm. that, the entire nation shook and they're like, you know, oh my God, rape is happening. Our daughters are not safe. There are women patrolling outside at night in Delhi. And, you know, mm. there are movies like, you know, Earth, Thursday, Kabil, Pink, where the, the, the issue of consent, issue of rape, issue of, you know, um, two people in a relationship has been highlighted. But when it comes to marriage, it is not there. And this is the reason why marital rape has not been criminalized yet. Hmm. So I think that, you know, women who go through this can c- come out and at least, you know, talk about it as a form of abuse first and maybe seek NGOs, seek people who, you know, have people from the same community as a support, you know, because first and, first and foremost, when a woman goes through that, you know, mm. so there has to be acceptance and second of all, the emotional trauma that she goes through, that is horrendous. Mm. So, you know, to, to eradicate that so she's physically fit to even fight a case, you need that kind of support, you need kind of people who have the same empathy or that level to you and to, to say that, oh my God, this has happened to you, I'm going to help you, you come to me. Mm. You know, so I think the best part is before it goes to court and before it, you know, there's a capital punishment or whatever that is, is mm-hmm. to find like kind of communities where women can come and at least say without us, you know, without a sense of shame that this has happened to me and I need help. Please, can you help me? And if right. uh, their husband are unwilling to accept the fact that it is wrong, then it isn't it better off to separate from them? Yeah, it is absolutely better off to separate, although divorce is a stigma in our society. Yeah, yeah, that, that stigma yeah. has to be broken. Yeah, but I think a lot of women now are very fearless. Mm. I know a lot of women, uh, my house helped for that matter. Like she was in an abusive relationship and her husband used to be under the influence of alcohol and hit her and she just mm. left, you know, and she's now, you know, she has, a, you know, like a shop and she's earning her own money and she has a daughter and she lives alone, you know, but at least she's in peace. So a lot of women, I think, have recognized this and come out of it. Please save yourself Mm. and come out of it. And they are doing that now. Slowly, slowly, it's taking time. But I feel the progress is seen. You know? Mm. Yeah, the progress is seen. And we can see it. Although it's it's a slow process. You know, Mm. I won't say it's not happening. It is happening. So it's better to Mm. separate and divorce from a... because And actually, when it comes to not only a marriage, any sort of relationship. You know, if Mm. there is no peace, there is no emotional stability, there is, you know, abuse, please walk out, you know. So, 
so yeah so that is that is what is the first step after that you seek help you go to legal you know depending on how much money you have what what is what what is it that you want right mm. so yeah so these there are a lot of factors actually you know so that's why it's hard to take a decision in general right. plus these are so sensitive so you know even harder for more like a girl's point of view or a lady especially when kids are involved yeah for other family that is again you know yeah. Yeah, yeah, because the husband will be like, you know, I want full custody of the kid, mm-hmm. or then the in-laws are involved. This so it, it's like two families, right? Because India yeah, is a bit yeah. traditional kind of mm-hmm. society. So you're you're mm-hmm. married to actually two families, not like two mm-hmm. people, which is actually you know very vague. Mm-hmm. Because in London or any other space, it is you know criminalized marital rape. Yeah. You can straight go to jail, and in a place like London, I've lived in London for three years. Like I like literally like I. like seen the law where they are like you know even if you stay with a say partner you're not married and this mm. happens to you with his own consent and you are that is also considered rape so it could be a boyfriend but your, mm. if your boyfriend is asking you for sex without a consent you can mm. still sue him you don't have to be married right because mm. yeah so so that is there not there in india now so yeah. that's why like it's you know marriage is again an institution you know mm. it's a loop hole and you know x y z so yeah and uh, western countries and india uh, have a stark contrast in their perspective of marriage yeah p- perspective of marriage uh, now see i'll give you example like in the us now mm. if two people are uh, live under the same roof you know mm. for more than a year or so they are uh, considered to be already married okay or they considered to be together it is not like you have to go on the mat a lot of people i know a lot of my friends i know who are in lgbt they live with their partners but not necessarily they're legally married hmm. because uh, outside the society they self centered hmm. right so today you want to live with somebody they're providing you what you want you're happy you're emotionally invested satisfied you live with that person hmm. tomorrow you don't you have every right please walk out it is my marriage it is my life and it's my part hmm. the involvement of family is very less and this is right. also a pro and a con right yeah so yeah so yeah so that is i think one of the biggest differences between hmm. uh, the western world and india so i was talking to my law professor the other day he said that uh, it is not that the court should not have the power to change the law if they want they can still do it and they want to but the thing is that unless until and unless uh, the consciousness of the whole society uh, changes uh, there will be no point in changing the law because there will be no implementation so unless the families actually take this matter seriously and there are there have been movements but uh, you know uh, among traditional people where the crime happens more so until then uh, even the courts hands are tied so okay so like you have done journalism so from your journalistic perspective or as a woman i would like to ask you how what are the steps that can be taken to pressurize the government to make a bill regarding the same um i think there are a lot of ngos and there are a lot of already a lot of um, communities that are hmm. filing so many petitions um you know like karnataka high court is fighting so much for it mm-hmm. and i get articles like according to karnataka high court you know in january 2022 only i think you know they filed a you know there's this uh, there's this um what what do i call it an activist and mm-hmm. um her name is chitra avasti like she mm-hmm. works with a lot of um like women like this who has gone to marital rape and abuse and all and she says that i get these kind of stories every single day of my life you know and like she is the founder of the rti foundation which also mm. is fi- fighting for uh, to criminalize marital rape so i think the only way is to as i said form like minded communities where you are heard where your story is recognized and where you are given that support where you are like you know we are the backbone for you you we are there for you please go fight right because for a woman when that comes in she is unstoppable mm. you know a lot of women they yeah they actually you know they really struggle to take the first step 
But once you give them that push, now, and I'm saying this from a human right. point of view also, you know, when I want to do something, sometimes, you know, I'm just like, should I do or not do? Because we mm. kind of, you know, overanalyze all these situations. But then I have one push from my father, my mom, and they're like, oh, do it, they're there for you. And I'm like, yeah, they're there for me. I need to do it. You know, mm. so stuff like that. So as long as that support is there, and I think that like my communities, and obviously now they, you know, they are putting more on awareness, education. Mm. So I think that's the way where it's coming out. At least now, marital rape is considered a rape. Earlier, it was not even recognized as nothing. Mm. You know, it, it was recognized as a casual phenomena. Now it is actually people are terming as rape and injustice and words like that, right? Like so, at least now it's being recognized as a rape. Now, next step is to, you know, take appropriate measures, take it up to the, you know, higher courts. Yeah. And then we'll see. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Okay. So let's so, yeah. jump to the topic of media. Right. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so there are basically three pillars of democracy, judiciary, executive, and legislature. Yes. But uh, the concept of the three pillars is to keep a check and balance on the other two. Right. So that, for yeah. example, the judiciary will uh, keep control that the executive or uh, the legislature do not make any laws or bills or uh, implement any action that may override the fundamental rights of the citizens. Right. So this concept or phenomena of journalism as the fourth pillar of democracy has been introduced. So can you elaborate on that? Um, see, when I said democracy, it is, you know, it's a nation where people have the greater say, and it is, you know, um, it is a nation where people choose their own leaders, where there is freedom of expression and speech, right, mm. which is not a fundamental right in our constitution. And no, uh, no country has full, uh, full, you know, implementation of freedom of speech. There are limitations, yeah. but, uh, you know, since media or journalism is a fourth pillar, like mm. press, without press, there is no freedom and expression of speech, mm. right? Press, right. Is, that's why it's a fourth pillar. And it is very important because without that, there is no uh, feedback or there's no communication between two mediums or what people want and what the government wants or what mm. government is doing and what people are saying. So there is no right. communication right. without media. Right. Mm. So uh, therefore, that is why it is so important, because it is basically a, a channel through which information is passing. Right. Mm. Especially in, in a democracy, it is very, very important, you know, mm. because you and now because everything is digital post COVID people are not meeting, there is zero or almost you know, zero physical, you know, contact, even voting processes, you know, you have to register online and everything. Mm. So without media, that in democracy, it's like a complete failure, mm. right? Therefore, um, actually, Marshall McLuhan, who is fa father of mo mo modern media, he says mm. that media is like an extended arm of the body. Mm. You know? Yeah, so it's like, it, it's a part of us because we have sources, you have electronic print or whatever media that is. Mm. But the main, the main thing is to transfer messages, is to know mm. what is happening, is to you know, bring in awareness, hmm. right? So that is why I think media <clears throat> is the fourth pillar of democracy and one of the most important pillars. And hmm. one more thing, it is not as controlled as the other three pillars. Because when you say hmm. about, uh, you know, judiciary and executive, these are controlled levels. Hmm. But in media, it is neutral, you know? Hmm. It is how a channel is functioning, what their audience is, so it is very either it's independent or it's controlled by somebody. Media has less control compared to these kind of other levels because those are at very stagnant and static level. Hmm. Right? Okay. So yeah. So I also feel that media can hold the people in the government accountable. Like citizens of the country do not have time to just watch around all the actions of the government. So if they form a scandal or do something wrong so at least the media can let us know yeah absolutely yeah so social media has also emerged uh, so absolutely. how can it be helpful in uh, spreading awareness 
um social media plays a big role in uh, yeah. today's uh, you know passing of information there is twitter there is instagram there is facebook these are basically social networking sites mm-hmm. where people can get information in a blink of a finger you know so what happens is information uh, the passing of information is really fast and right. so yeah and so our so the platform is so basically open so anybody can come and you know write their opinion out there you know it's like But, sometimes like you know, know i see sorry yeah sorry uh, i uh, isn't it like a double edged sword that it is a good thing that anyone can Talk, share their viewpoints, but some people uh, post it Take as facts. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. I mean, yeah. It, it always has its pros and cons, you know. Right. Then, if you right. say internet is also has its pros and cons, right? Because mm. Mm. Uh, what you see on you know, what you search, okay, there is dark mm. web also, which you know you can do a lot of illegal activities. So everything, I think, is the you know what it's like a coin. you know mm-hmm. so to 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 two sides like bad and good both you know mm-hmm. so i see i see like you know let's say sonu sood for example mm-hmm. sonu sood has literally helped so many people just via twitter right you know he's read mm-hmm. tweets from people who are like you know you know i need help i have flooded at home during covid i don't have food and he's literally sent you know food to that person's place and we get a tweet saying that sonu sood helped this many people right mm-hmm. and he's the new hero For example, mm. so that's how Twitter is also doing good things, and there are also bad things like you know somebody has been you know slut shamed on Twitter, or some picture has been leaked, someone is getting you know harassment calls. So every media has you know it's like a coin, as I said, you know it's right. two sides, good or bad. It's how you perceive it, how it's how you use it. Okay. Right. And so, what is it that you yeah. want out of? It? Yeah. Yeah. So you think that. Uh... traditional media which uh, has a system of uh, you know checking the content uh, before posting it is it better this way or is it that anyone who saw anything should just post it um i think it's good to check what you post right. and it's good to be aware of what you're posting and know what you're posting especially if you have a message to give to somebody and if you have a audience now hmm. if i'm working with kids and i have a audience say i'm i'm working on a, a preschool startup and i have to hmm. talk to kids i have to be very careful of what i write and what i put out mm-hmm. right Definitely. because i am yeah. talking to a certain yeah certain right. audience right but if i know that i'm talking to teenagers i'm talking to adults of about 25 maybe i can hmm. put a little you know um you know explicit Uh, remarks so i can put people are stupid people is. people will take anything at face value absolutely yeah and everybody's <laughs> opinion seems valid on social media yeah. sometimes yeah. you can't even yeah. have a conversation on social media like there are comments that people are just fight hmm. you know and i am bringing my tea and i am like acha theek hai karo karo main dekh rahi you know so it's funny you know so yeah, yeah. some some people get their uh, source of information from social media only exclusively like uh, so yeah. their uh, viewpoint may be very skewed because it may come off as biased because what facebook is showing them or anything uh okay uh i would like to ask you uh, as a matter of con do you think it is a con of traditional media are they biased good question so um i think it really depends um it's a very neutral phenomena and it's on how you perceive it right? right so it depends it depends on what kind of new channel it is what is their uh you know let's say the final uh, aim who is hmm. their audience and what kind of news are they pushing you right. know when it comes to political news sometimes you are under pressure or you are under situations where you need to say certain things in order to you know um you know reach out to certain audience or reach mm. out to a certain kind of you know answer right hey. you know uh, yeah so then you are under pressure of you know saying a certain thing that you know you, i have to say this otherwise my news is not going to get get out of the channel or my news will not even go Mm. or it won't even be viewed you know so right. then you are when you are working in big corporates maybe then you mm. know because you are under a team you are working with a lot of like people 
vast areas of life and you your opinion is not the final opinion so, hmm. so you don't have much say and then you have you don't have a choice but you have to be like okay i will say i'll do what my senior has said because i'm i'm working in, in an organization and i have to go by the rules and ethics of the organization if i want to survive in that organization if i'm an independent journalist i can have my own blog i can write whatever you know i want and get criticized for it and I, i can shut down the blog if i want right hey. but in an organization i cannot do that so hey. i would say it really depends it's a new, it's a neutral i would not say a yes or a no it's a neutral um answer for me and hey. but one thing i've noticed is people have a attraction towards negative news negative you know yeah so if a journalist for example is only publishing happy stories okay mm. let's say bhutan is one of the happiest countries uh, you know yeah. let's say sources have found okay okay one day i posted that oh that's really nice that bhutan is a happy country for example okay. but how long will i be able to only you know only see the bright side and my career as a journalist will not progress no mm. so i have to bring out the problems i have to bring out you know the okay there there is a bomb blast here and there have this many people have died and that's why there is a shortage of food and now you know government is bringing heavy like you know helicopters to you know rescue the people for example hmm. so these kind of news although it's disturbing people watch it and people are oh my god this has happened i didn't know you know so yeah. people have a reaction towards negative or bad news and that right. has become i think the new you know bias that publish hardcore you know political news which has a negative impact and you know which brings in that sensation that controversy which is not always very good because there yeah, are like, other like like yeah when when you're driving your car in the highway and there is an accident so you immediately slow down your car to look but if uh, it's everything is normally going on you won't give a second look right something like that right Yeah, absolutely. Shock yeah, value. Yeah. And suppose yeah. I'm driving that car, and I am not even involved in an accident. I'm a little far yeah. away. I'll be like, "What the hell happened? What's happening yeah. there?" Yeah. Or we will go there. My business. But why am yeah. I, you know, worried? Because yeah. I am attracted. Yeah. I want to yeah. know. Yeah. Right. There's this right. curiosity. So that question right. mark. So yeah. Okay. So uh, is print media dying? Is print media dying? <laughs> we should ask this to our viewers actually also um i think okay. print media is definitely not dying but mm. it is on the verge of dying okay yeah because you know lot of uh, now everything is getting digitalized and after mm. covid even more you know because people are avoiding all sorts of physical contact and um there is a sum of people who still read the newspaper like my grandmother generation people but i think people like us or even my parents for now they you know people don't have time they commuting mm. they're on a local they're on a metro you know you get you have your phone you have a tablet you get news on a right you know, a click of click of your finger you know right. so and you know lot of a uh, lot of print agencies also is you know going very consumer friendly they are, they are you know giving a lot of importance to environment right? right so they want to yeah they want to make it all digital they don't want so many so much paper i mean mm. outlook magazine is one of the greatest you know magazine that i used to subscribe for a very long time and me and my family mm. outlook money outlook business we discontinue the subscription because we are like we don't need it if we want to read anything we we'll download the app the toi app the outlook app and we have it all there Hmm. right everyone has smartphones and actually one good example of this is you know ikea the brand ikea so they yeah. they discontinued their print catalog after covid okay. because okay. they were like we don't need it you know everything right. is on our website our website is top notch and hmm. we have a good branding people know us we are all over the globe we do not need a print catalog for you know people to see and to know who we are even in so some i was saying, high uh even in some high class restaurants even the menu is gone right digital qr codes yeah 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 yeah, yeah. yeah sorry yeah. you were saying yeah so i was saying that yeah as i said a print uh, is definitely not dying but it's on the verge of dying and right. i think slowly slowly another 10 years not even 10 years i think 5 years it'll be very limited sources hmm. yeah right okay what values should a journalist have? should a journalist have 
have. Uh, yeah. Like in terms of like when they collect the news or? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, the ethics. Ethics. Yeah. Um, journalism ethics, uh, there are a couple of uh, them. Um, first, your news has to be from an authentic source. And right. um, you, yeah, you need to know what you want to write and what you want to publish. Hmm. Um, and who is your audience? I think that is very, very important. Who right. you are writing to? Who are you talking to? What tone will you use? Okay. Can you what disclose? Is the message that you yeah. Can you dis Can you disclose your source? Um. As, as a journalist, yeah. Usually, when you are a part of a organization, you cannot. You cannot. Okay. Um. But I think a lot of independent journalists, when they write, uh, sometimes, you know, you see in the bottom, they put up sources or they say right. that I found this article via this and you just hyperlink the article. So, right. uh, but if you are, you know, working in a big uh, organization, you cannot do that because right. you are going through them. So whatever sources you hmm. have is through, them, through, through right. them. So you cannot then you cannot. Okay. And as I said, yes, you need to know your audience and you need to know where the news is coming from, how you are getting it and what is it that you want to say. You have to be basically very clear with what you want to say and what you want to portray out. Hmm. Right? right? And whether or not that is true or not true, that is, you know, for the audience to read and they will perceive it the way they perceive it. Right, but your sometimes, especially when you when you're working and you're a full time journalist, your role is to put out the news. Right, right. It's hmm. true, not true. Somebody believes it, doesn't believe it. There's a controversy. That is the secondary part. But I think it's true. It should be true. But I, I'm saying in general that, for example, if you, you're putting out a news story, your your work as a journalist is to just put out the news story to the best yeah. of your ability right. to the audience that you know who's reading it or whatever it is once you've done your job then you know it is the audience job to perceive what they want to right. perceive to say what they want to say that is not in your control as right. long as you do your job top notch as a journalist hmm. right. that is put out the news know your audience be authentic hmm. with the sources as much as you can if you're un in an organization maybe follow the protocol of the organization because you are serving them so it, it depends right hmm. so yeah okay one last question i would like to ask you what is investigative journalism and how do reporters risk their lives to get news so investigative journalism as i think i term it as very hardcore journalism Hmm. And um, it is one of the rawest form of journalism, according to me. And it requires you to be mentally and physically very, very sound to do a kind of a job like this. And hmm. um, I think there are very less people who actually go out in the field and they report such stories. They're risking their lives. They're putting their families in, you know, their families literally put, you know, they send their children and, you know, right, they're doing right. that job. Like, you know, like right. say, you know, on like, like when they do live stories, for example. Mm. So it is, it is very, uh, it is very brave of people who choose this kind of, you know, kind of type of journalism. And mm. I think that to go out there and to risk yourself, especially when you're doing hardcore political news or hardcore news where you know that, you know, I am supposed to, I'm putting out a source, putting out a story where my life is in danger, but you have so much passion for your field or your work that you're willing mm. to do that. I remember my dad telling me that, you know, Shota, you should just stick to writing articles and you should just stick to doing maybe, you know, uh, you know, base level political news because I don't want you to go to, you know, investigate journalism, you know, something might happen to you or, yeah. you know, are you like interested? I am like, you know, yeah, I understand your concern, you know, as a parent, you know, yeah. because I was thinking that, you know, should I try? And then he was like, <laughs> so slow, you know. So mm. definitely, you know, someone out there, their, their parents, and, you know, with the network suppose somebody is you know um doing a live reporting and there's a bomb blast suddenly and you know there is no network so imagine mm. their families what they do so i think if you if your pet you know if you have that understanding with your family and if you are brave enough and you know that you can do it 
like to the full of your ability, then investigative journalism is for you, right? Mm. Otherwise, yeah, if you if you have a bit of a second thought also, I think, you know, nobody should, if you are only 100% sure, go for investigative journalism. It is a great experience, I feel. I would love to do it maybe one day. But uh, really? yeah, it, yeah, I would love to do it. I mean, just to try, maybe not forever. Okay. Uh, but yeah, but also I think with investigative journalism, you can only do it till a certain amount of time or age. Okay. You know, after that, I think, you know, a lot of journalists, I feel like those who have been there, you know, war and stuff, they retire after a certain mm. period of time and they get into, say, full time freelancing or they join an organization, they mm. tell their experiences. So, because it, you, you, your body and your mind will only allow you to do that till a certain amount of time. Mm-hmm. Right? I know a journalist who's also very related to me. She, she did that in Iraq and stuff. And then she retired, she married. She, when you get married and stuff, you know, you have to kind of give up. You cannot be on feel all the time when you have kids. Mm. So, but but you know, then she told me that you know, I retired and now like I miss going to the field. I miss like live reporting, authentic, you know, doing the authentic news work. But I also like, you know, the piece I, I have here, the kind of certainty that I have here. Your life mm. is going to be very uncertain when you are in a field like that. Mm. Right? Definitely. And if you're brave enough to embrace that certainty and you know uncertainty and stay, then this field is for you. It was very informative talking to you. I'll stop I the recording. <laughs> no, you did uh, very well. I'll stop the recording.